So my new book is called Citizen Scientist, Searching for Heroes and Hope in an Age of Extinction. And citizen science is regular people contributing to scientific research, which is something that today is turbocharged by smartphone technology. The fundamental thing that we need that we have today is is collecting observations of nature, which means in the case of something like iNaturalist, which is a tool that you can use to become a citizen scientist right this minute. It's a free web-based app. And with iNaturalist, you take an observation of a plant, a bug, a tree. And iNaturalist runs these pictures of what people's observations of nature are like a Facebook feed. So if you don't know what you just took a picture of, an expert somewhere using the site is likely to come along and see your observation and make an ID. So this kind of observation takes its place in a line going all the way back to Darwin. So when Darwin went to the Galapagos and he took note of the plants and animals that he saw there, he noticed that they were different but the same, similar but different to the plants and animals he saw in Ecuador. And they had become separate. They had become separate species because they were ge geographically distinct places. So today we have geographically distinct places all around the world. And, and we have all species all around the world. But scientists don't actually know where all these species are and in what amounts. And it's important that we know that information because we're losing species today at a rate and magnitude that took out the dinosaurs. Um, it's very bad news for a lot of reasons. <laughs> but even your one observation using iNaturalist can help put together that picture of where species are today and what's happening to them. When I started this book, I, the very first project that I went on explicitly for this book was, and I still go on this, this um, monitoring project with the California Academy of Sciences to monitor a tide pool in Half Moon Bay. And the, we go out to this beautiful, incredible spot at Pillar Point, and, and when the tide is very, very low, there's just this enormous revealed reef. It's just the most spectacular place. <laughs> and we, the sites that we monitor, so when you monitor sites, you, put a, a tr you make a transect, you define an area, and then you go periodically back to it to count the species, or not all the species in it. Usually you're, you're looking for certain special species that you're gonna track over time. When you track those species over time, you're gonna get a sense of, of how their populations are changing, what's happening in the ocean, what's happening in the intertidal. So this, the places where we monitor were chosen because there were so many sea stars in them. There was like 70 sea stars in one of the plots the first day that we went out in 2012. So very shortly after we started monitoring those sea stars, uh, they disappeared. They disappeared entirely from Pillar Point. And it turns out they were disappearing from the entire coast of North America, essentially. It's the biggest marine die-off known to human history still going on. We know that it's due to what's called a sea star wasting syndrome caused by a virus. Now the virus we happen to know was in the water prior, a lot, years prior to this happening, partly because the, the coast has been monitored for years. And this is a super important use of iNaturalist and it kind of, it kind of shows how very useful the app is in the, in the sense of scaling. So when you go out, and I go out, and I take my one little picture of a sea star or a sea anemone in the tide pool, and it goes up onto iNaturalist, you think, well, that's what I did today. But if you have hundreds of people doing that all up and down the coast over time, you actually start to get a whole map of life as it's going on in the intertidal. And then if you can imagine that that can go on all around the globe with all sorts of species, all sorts of taxa, then we can actually really start to get a picture of, of many layers of nature and what's happening to it. So one of the things that is so exciting about citizen science, especially as personified in a tool like iNaturalist, is that the one thing that one person can do becomes part of a global effort. And so you might just, I might just go out there because I love being in the tide pool and it makes me happy. I think it's the ozone or something. It just makes me happy out there. Um, but even so, and even if I'm not the best citizen scientist, which I'm not, I'm not that good at IDing too many things, um, other people are really good at it, and my piece of data is useful to them. 
citizen science is not going to save nature, it is our tool for saving nature. And today we're a little bit in danger of being pleased with ourselves for collecting the data. And it's necessary to collect the data. But we also have to really get together in our communities and uh, in our towns, in our regions, and identify what are the conservation outcomes we need where we live. And then you might ask, what citizen science data do we need to take to our um, representatives, to our board of supervisors, to our county officials, to tell them what the issue is? I mean, they need to see data. But that's a way to define what data you need. It might be a way for you to define an iNaturalist project. So let's not forget that the data collection is super important. The science is very important for scientists to ask their questions about species. But really even more important than the science is on the ground conservation outcomes. You've heard probably of this term, the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is defined, or it's a term that people are using to describe our moment in time where human impacts are so large on the, on the earth that they're actually already discernible in the geological record. So this is, permeates our life, right? It's, it's, um, it's comprehensive, it's total, it's immersive. It's hard to identify, well, what part of it is a problem and what part of it isn't. It's hard to figure out even how to grapple conceptually with it. So citizen science, though, is a way not, maybe to help grapple with it conceptually but also as kind of a way to visualize what's going on, where the impacts are. And one of the important things going on is, is that, you know, extinction and words like geological time frame, these, these are concepts that are hard for us in this one moment in time, right? Right now, like I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I want a snack, I'm tired. You know, I'm living in the moment, really, and I'm not thinking about any kind of deep time. But citizen science actually puts us in a line with those who have come before us and with their observations of nature in a big, long narrative that we're continuing today.